So I'm Nicholas Von Bredo, your president of the Realtors Association of Hamilton Burlington this year, and I'm happy to be emceeing today's event. Before we get started with the presentation, we do have a few housekeeping items we have to go over in regards to code of conduct and items like that. So today, uh, we are committed to providing a safe and productive and welcoming environment for all meeting participants and event staff. All participants, including but not limited to attendees, speakers, volunteers, staff members, and all others are expected to abide by this meeting code of conduct. We also kindly ask that you avoid any disruptions during the presentation, during sessions, there will be ample time, or sorry, after the, uh, after the presentations will be ample time for questions and answers. All participants must comply with these basic rules to ensure that we have a comfortable, safe, and respectful environment for everyone present. So in general, please keep the dialogue uh, respective, respectful and productive. Um, in addition to the code of conduct, there's also some ground rules regarding competition law. RAB fully supports compliance with all Canadian laws, including the Competition Act. All members are therefore reminded that questions, discussions, or comments should be respectful of competitors and should avoid sensitive topics which could raise potential competition issues, such as comments regarding competitors' business models or pricing and commission. So, and finally, I also would like to acknowledge RAB's 2023 corporate sponsors displayed on the screen coming up here. Thank you to Geo Warehouse. The Real, Ontario Real Estate, uh, sorry, <laughs> thank you to Geo Warehouse, the Ontario Real Estate Association, Canadian Real Estate Association, Niche for Design Inc., MPAC, Hugh Whitmore LLP, Ross McBride, and the Hamilton Tire Cats. So as I mentioned, following the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers, and both, both in-person and virtual attendees will be able to pose questions. After the question and answer, I'll be back on stage here to, with, for a couple quick announcements and a draw for a winner of two tickets to the up, upcoming Tiger Cats game. Please note that you must be in attendance and either in person or virtually at today's event in its entirety to be, able to, to be eligible to win the tickets. I'm thrilled to welcome Ray Ferris, our speaker today. Many of you know Ray as the 2016 president of ARIA and chair of the ARIA, task, ARIA Tressa Task Force. Ray has been a realtor for 27 years, and he's the broker of record for Erie Edge Real Estate Limited, a brokerage located in beautiful Long Point and Point Rowan. Ray is a fourth generation owner of the old cut boat livery in Long Point, and his claim to fame is making dill pickle fries famous at his food truck at Chip Ship. <laughs> so welcome, Ray, and thank you for coming out today. Really appreciate it. So it was the Ontario Real Estate Association in 2016 who said to the then provincial government, we need to modernize real estate legislation here in Ontario. And I was president of ARIA in 2016. And the reason we made that decision, well, and those of you who were in the business in 2016 will remember this very well. That is the year that CBC Marketplace caught six realtors on hidden camera doing some very bad things to consumers. Nothing pisses off a realtor more than another realtor doing the, the wrong thing. Wouldn't you guys agree? So we strategically made a decision to ask the government to raise the bar and the government listened. And so we consulted with the government in 2016 up until 2019 where they received all of our recommendations on how to modernize the app. So we were there from day one. We were part of the lobbying that got the government to modernize the app. Then the government of the day created new regulations, draft regulations, and they consulted with the Ontario Real Estate Association and real estate boards across the province and other stakeholders about possible new legislation in the province. And it was in fact, a RAB member who struck a task force for ORIA to be able to consult with the provincial government. And he's here with us today. That's 2020 president of ORIA, 2020, right, Sean? Sean Morrison. So you guys, all of us in Ontario, owe Sean a lot of thanks for the hard work that he did to get the government to listen to ARIA as the trusted voice in real estate. Not only did Sean get the government 
to listen to us as part of our consultation process. 2020, remember what happened then? COVID, right? Sean spoke so well on our behalf that real estate was declared an essential service in the province of Ontario, and that wasn't the way it was across the entire country and south of the border. So join me in thanking Sean. I'm going to show you some of the goals that Sean set for us in 2020 when he set out this Trust for Real Estate Services Act Regulations Task Force, which I've been honored to chair since 2020. Nick mentioned it, I've been a realtor for 27 years. So you guys might be saying, what does a 27-year realtor happen to know about the Trust and Real Estate Services Act? Well, I've been there from day one, from the lobbying through to the consultation, and a real will have your back when Tressa is in fact proclaimed. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. I've been eating, breathing, and sleeping this stuff for the last several years. I know a lot of you have questions about what Tressa means in your business. I want to say if you've been getting your information from social media, you're probably misinformed about what some of this stuff means. There are lawyers out there who are giving incorrect legal advice about some of this stuff that we're going to talk about today. So you came to the right spot to get the right information, and I'll say it one last time. We've been there from lobbying, we've been there consulting, and we will be there with you on proclamation. Like I said, I'm not an instructor, I'm a realtor like each and every one of you. So I just do want to say off the top that none of the information that I share with you today should be construed as legal advice. There's going to be a lot of information that I share with you guys today that brokerage management will have to create policies <laughs> for. More important than that, however, is just due to the nature of the regulatory process, some of this stuff could possibly change prior to Tressa coming into effect. If that happens, Aria will communicate with every member and every real estate board expeditiously. However, don't lose any sleep over it. It's highly, highly, highly unlikely that any of this information is going to change. As a matter of fact, stay tuned very closely to communications from Aria because any day now, I think we will learn from the government when Tressa will come into effect. Really quickly, this session is broken down into four different uh, buckets. First is I'm going to review very quickly phase one of Tressa, which you guys are already familiar with, but I'm going to refresh it for you. We're going to spend most of our time together talking about those key regulatory changes as part of phase two. I'm going to give you a real quick sneak peek as to the work that we still got to do when the government asks us to consult with them on other changes to real estate legislation in Ontario. And then I'm happy to take questions for as long as, as, as time allows. So these are the three goals that Sean charged me with it, uh, to achieve back in 2020. First, he said, make sure that the new real estate legislation in the province of Ontario raises the bar so high that Ontario is the leader in North America when it comes to real estate standards. Secondly, he said, find ways for our members to have new tools for their business success. And we all know that after 10 years of lobbying, the government allowed us to create personal real estate corporations. And another new tool for us as realtors, but more beneficial is to consumers, open offers. We're gonna have a very controversial discussion today about the open offer process. And what did I say? Nothing ticks us off more than those bad actors who give us all a black eye. Tressa gives the regulator, that is the Real Estate Council of Ontario, more regulatory powers, okay? We all know that fines for individual realtors have doubled from 25,000 to 50,000 and for broker just from 50 to $100,000. So really quickly, the reason that the government broke this down into three phases is because these changes are not minor amendments to the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act. These are huge changes. To break it down into bite-sized pieces, the government said, we're gonna do this in three phases. Phase one, already in effect, that delivered personal real estate corporations and new descriptors for registrants. 
really quickly. What does a personal real estate corporation do? If you're not familiar, it will allow you as a member to access the business advantages of incorporation, including tax and income planning benefits. Since personal real estate corporations have been permitted for us as realtors, to date, over 10,000 Ontario realtors have in fact formed personal real estate corporations. If you want to know more about what is a personal real estate corporation and is it beneficial to me and my business and how do I set one up, there's two links on the screen for you. We're going to be sharing this presentation with Brad and send you guys afterwards. The first link is from Maria, the second is from Rico. These are outstanding links where you can get more information if you want them. Next. The current code of ethics was amended so that we could use other descriptors to refer to ourselves in our marketing. If you guys have been in the business for a while, you'll know that if you're registered as a salesperson under the act, you have to call yourself a salesperson or a real estate sales representative, or you have to, right? So when we met with the ministry to consult on this, we said, look, consumers don't call us real estate salespeople. More often than not, what did they call us? Real estate agents or realtors. So we said to the government, look, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, let's call it a duck. Let consumers call us, let us refer to ourselves in the way that consumers already refer, refer to us as, and the government delivered. So today, you can use those old descriptors if you want. If you want to call yourself a real estate sales representative, you can. But if you want to call yourself a real estate agent or a realtor, you're now permitted to do that, right? Brokers of record, however, still have to refer to ourselves as brokers of record. A lot of people say to me, whoa, now that realtor is embedded in the code of ethics, does that mean a person who is not a member of a local real estate board like RAB, and therefore not a member of ARIA and CREA, can they now use the term realtor because it's embedded in the code? And the answer is absolutely not. You still must remain a member of CREA in good standing to call yourselves a realtor. Here's where we're going to spend a lot of time this morning. And my job today is to alleviate any fears or as many as I can or concerns that you have about the new legislation. Okay, we're going to cover six key topics. The first really quickly is an updated code of ethics. Then we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about new definitions, terms, and disclosure. Then I'm gonna introduce the new consumer information guide to you. I'm gonna talk really quickly about the strengthening of RICO's discipline committee. We don't have to spend a lot of time there because none of us are gonna find ourselves in trouble with the regulator. We're gonna spend a good chunk of time talking about that new open offer process. And lastly, I'm gonna introduce designated representation to you. Really quickly, we're all intimately familiar with the current code of ethics under the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act. That document is 11 pages long. Our members at ARIA have said to us that it's too big, it's difficult to navigate, it's too burdensome. And the reason that it's so large and the reason that it's so heavy is because it in fact is a mix of procedural and technical requirements in addition to the ethical requirements that we should adhere to. So a key ask of the Ontario Real Estate Association was to remove all of that technical and procedural stuff out of the code of ethics and move it into the general regulation and let the code of ethics be just that. Let the code of ethics be a document which contains pr principle-based articulating requirements that we must adhere to with specific emphasis on matters of integrity, quality of interest, and quality of service. The new code of ethics, once Tressa comes into effect, is two pages long, that's it. If you wanna have a peek at the draft code, you can find it on the ARIA website at orea.com forward slash advocacy. We all know that under the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act, there's two key relationships that we're all intimately familiar with, right? Their customer and client. When we consulted with the government, they told us that consumers are oftentimes confused about the differences between being a customer and a client. Who would agree with that, right? A lot of you are saying yes. 
when we met with Rico, the registrar said, not only are consumers confused about the difference between a customer and a client, so are Ontario registrants. And, and look, we're all practitioners. We all work with a realtor who screws this stuff up, I bet, right? And not on purpose, but it's complicated. So the ministry said to us, this is so complicated. There's too many errors. We need to clean this up. So the way that the government has done that, once Tresset is proclaimed, customer ceases to exist. And I mean ceases to exist altogether. And in its place will be a new term that you need to be intimately familiar with. And that new term is self-represented party. So customer is long gone. Client, however, will remain the same. So you, there's no learning curve for client. That remains the same. But self-represented party is very new and it's very different. So the regulations under TRESA define a self-represented party, which I'm gonna say, which I'm gonna call an SRP for the rest of today's session, quite simply as a party who is not a client of any brokerage. That's easy, right? They're just simply not a client, right? Here's the takeaway that you must, this is the golden nugget you must take away from the discussion of SRP. That's the second bullet point on your screen. You can interact with a consumer who chooses to be self-represented. And I'm gonna say that again. It is the real estate consumer's choice today, whether they're a customer or a client, right? Are you with me? It's the consumer's choice. It's not our choice, it's the consumer's choice whether they're a customer or a client. Once TRESA comes into effect, it is the consumer's choice whether they're self-represented or they're a client. So if you interact, if you encounter a consumer who chooses to be self-represented for whatever reason, and that's a, an entirely different discussion, but if you encounter a consumer who chooses to be self-represented, you can provide assistance to them if you satisfy two criteria, you've got to cement these two criteria in your mind. If this is the standard that the regulator will hold you to. First, you can interact, you can provide assistance to an SRP. One, if the service that you're offering that SRP is in fact a service to your actual client. So let me put that in real estate language that we all understand. My brokerage lists a property for sale. The seller is therefore our client, right? The seller is a client of the brokerage. I can show our brokerage's listing to a buyer who chooses to be self-represented for whatever reason, because showing that seller's home to a buyer is a service to the seller, right? That's clear, that's easy to understand, right? Here's the second part. This is where some people will struggle. Any interaction or any assistance with the individual who chooses to be self-represented must not cause that individual to rely on your skill, your knowledge, or your judgment. So let's use my buyer SRP example. The buyer wants to look at your brokerage's listing. You show it to the buyer. The buyer says to you, Ray, I think this place is overpriced. What do you think? I can't answer that because answering that question uses my skill, my knowledge, and my judgment, right? So I hope that example helps you understand, but this is the golden nugget when it comes to the self-represented party. It's got to be a service to a client of the brokerage. It's got to be a service to your actual client. And the second part is any interaction you have with that individual must not cause that individual to rely on your skill, knowledge, and judgment. We're going to talk about that a little bit more because I really need you to understand that. Now, there's two new documents that we need to get intimately familiar with as realtors. The first is the information guide. I'm not going to talk a lot about the information guide yet because the information guide is not unique to an SRP. Every real estate consumer must be provided a copy with the, S with the information guide. 
every consumer, not just SRPs. What is unique to the SRP is a new document called the Self-Represented Party Acknowledgement Form. The Self-Represented Party Acknowledgement Form must be provided to and reviewed with any individual who chooses to be self-represented. So let's take a look at what's on this SRP Acknowledgement Form. First, I have to say, this form, according to legislation, must be prepared by RICO. If RAB doesn't like this form, if your brokerage doesn't like this form, if you as a realtor don't like this form, you can't create your own. The legislation says you have to use this form, no alternatives. So the first thing I want to point out is that this form is really nothing more than a disclosure document. It says right up front to the individual who chooses to be self-represented, the brokerage represents a client in this transaction. And by choosing to be self-represented, you are entirely on your own. So it says loudly and clearly to the individual who wants to go it alone, we have a client in this transaction and you're going it alone. And I think that's a good thing, right? Do we not want to work as professional realtors with consumers who are fully informed? Of course we do, right? So let's look at what is actually on this disclosure document. First, it explains to the individual who chooses to be self-represented all of the risks that they're undertaking, right? It says, look, you're choosing to go it alone. You're assuming a lot of risks. You need to know what those risks are. Then this document will describe the type of assistance that the brokerage is permitted to provide. If that statement, and this is extracted directly from the regulations, leads you to believe that we're going to receive a laundry list from the regulator or from the ministry saying, here's the things you can do on behalf of an SRP. That's not what this set means. I know that's a little bit misleading, but what do you think number three means? What is the description of the type of assistance we are permitted to provide to an SRP? Think back to that golden nugget slide. You've got to have a client in the transaction and any interaction with that SRP must not cause the SRP to rely on your skill, knowledge, or judgment. So this disclosure document is telling that consumer right then and there, because you choose to be unrepresented, you are not entitled to receive any of the realtor's skill, knowledge, or judgment. And again, I think this document is a very good thing because consumers are going to enter these transactions if they choose to be self-represented for whatever reason, knowing you're getting nothing from me. And here's all the risks that you're assuming. Some of you might have a hard time swallowing point number four. This document prepared by the regulator actually recommends to the self-represented party that they seek independent professional advice. <laughs> What do we commonly think of as independent professional advice? Legal, right? Lawyers, right? But this goes a step further. This document recommends to the consumer that chooses to be unrepresented. You may want to go talk to a lawyer to help you draft these documents. Or you know what? You may want to go talk to another real estate brokerage because I, as the listing brokerage, represent the seller in my example. So this document that you have to present to the SRP says we recommend you go talk to somebody else. I want to say that doesn't mean they have to go talk to somebody else. How many of you have recommended to a buyer to get a home inspection and they don't? We've all had that, right? That's, the regulations don't say they have to go get independent professional advice. The regulations say you have to recommend to them that they do so. Doesn't mean they have to. And lastly, you have to present this document to the self-represented party and you have to ask them to sign it. If they sign it, you have to give them a copy, okay? So the ministries, the government's expectation here is that giving those individuals who choose to be self-represented this form means that they know the ramifications of the decisions that they're making. And if that's not a good thing, that consumers know what they're deciding, okay? So that, that's a new form. So I know the million dollar question that's on your minds. 
is what can I assist an individual with who chooses to be self-represented? What kind of interactions can I have with these consumers who want to go it alone? So we asked this exact question to the ministry. The, que the question we asked is on the screen, the big bold at the top. Under what circumstances could a self-represented party interact with the restaurant? <laughs> so the response from the ministry was that we can interact with an individual who chooses to be self-represented in two different kinds of circumstances without our interaction giving rise to an agency relationship. The first is we can give general information relating to the business of trading in real estate to the individual who chooses to be unrepresented. So that's a good thing. We can continue to go to a cocktail party and if somebody at the cocktail party approaches us and says, hey, Ray, how's the market in Hamilton? I can brief them on how the market is behaving in Hamilton. Okay. And the ministry's response is you can share general real estate market secrets. But here's the bigger part of this, the, these two responses that the ministry provided us. You guys already know this. It's that golden nugget of this. We can interact. We can provide assistance to an SRP. If what? We have a client in the transaction, and that interaction doesn't cause that consumer to rely on our skill knowledge and judgment. Okay. You can have those interactions for the benefit of the broker client so long as you not using your skill and knowledge and judgment. Now, I don't like the ministry's example. I'm using this example because it's, it's, this is the example that the ministry gave us. And I'm going to pick on my friend Tam or Fammy. So you'll see guys on the screen that the ministry says that to expedite the client sale of real estate, the registrant may assist the SRP with the mechanics of filling out an agreement of purchase and sale. So Tamar, you've got a property listed for sale. A buyer, for whatever reason, chooses to be self-represented, right? The buyer has a house to sell. The buyer tells you, Tamar, I, I can't buy this house until I sell my own, but I want to make an offer. How do you proceed, Tamar, with the drafting of the agreement of purchase and sale for the SRP, specifically with the condition relating to the sale of the buyer's property? We're going to find out by your answer whether you paid attention to the virtual or not. <laughs> But I want to focus right on the condition in the agreement of purchase and sale pertaining to the sale of the buyer's property. So let me put it to you this way, Tamar, in the interest of time. Are you, as the realtor, going to draft the condition for the SRP that says this offer is conditional upon the sale of the buyer's property known as 123 Main Street, blah, blah, blah. Are you going to do that? So Tamar said, if you couldn't hear him, Tamar said, as a service to the client of the brokerage, the seller, I'm going to draft that condition pertaining to the sale of the buyer's property. Don't shoot the messenger, ladies and gentlemen. Think back to those two things you must remember when interacting with an SRP. Think to the second part. Any assistance, any interaction must not use your skill, knowledge, and judgment. The regulator will say that if Tamar drafts that condition pertaining to the sale of the buyer's property like we would do now with a customer, Tamar used his skill, his knowledge, and judgment to use that right condition. And I can't take questions until the very end. I'm sorry, because we don't have enough time. But keep that thought, because we'll answer it at the end. So whether you like this or not, the expectation of Tressa and the interpretation of RICO is that in this example of a self-represented party who has a house to sell, 
you should not be drafting that condition because you are using your skill, your knowledge and judgment to use the right language. I know some of you are rolling your eyes saying that is absurd. This is a waste of time. How the heck are we gonna make this happen? This is what the regulator is gonna say. The regulator is going to say a couple of things and I'm not picking on the regulator. They've got to live with this stuff too, okay? So the regulator said to me in a meeting, Ray, if you have a self-represented party who isn't going to go get independent professional advice after they got that form and they want you to assist them with filling out the mechanics of an agreement of purchase and sale, you can pull out the APS Ray. They need to fill in the rest because anytime you fill out anything on that document, Ray, you're using your skill, your knowledge and judgment. And I agree with the regulator, regulator's interpretation, whether we like it or not, this is the expectation that we've been handed. Okay. So the regulator said to me, Rico's registrar said to me, Ray, the seller can make an offer to the buyer to which I jumped out of my chair during that meeting. I said, that is absolutely entirely unrealistic. And Tamara used to be chair of Rico. We all know that, right? Tamara's a quality. However, so is that going to work? Are you going to go to your seller and say, you know what, Tamar? Tamar's my seller. Tamar, we got a buyer that's interested in your property. He's unable to fill out the contracts himself. You need to make him an offer. I don't think sellers are going to like that. I don't think we're going to like that, but some of them may. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making a judgment call. I think what's more realistic is that we give that SRP, and remember, it's their decision to be crazy enough to go it alone. Let them fill out that agreement of purchase and sale, and let them scribble on Schedule A, I have to sell my house. I know that sounds laughable, but how many of you have received an agreement of purchase and sale from another realtor that you've had to rewrite? So it's not as extreme as it sounds, but look, if you're gonna interact with an SRP, and notice what I said there, if you're going to interact with an SRP, in my brokerage, I've created a policy, once Tressa is in effect, nobody in my brokerage is permitted to interact with an SRP without my involvement because I don't want them in hot water if they do this wrong, right? But the SRP can scribble. Look guys, you can write an offer on a piece of toilet paper and it could be a legal contract if both parties sign it. It doesn't have to be a tangent, but look, you got to take that agreement of purchase and sale that we know the self-represented party is going to make a dog's breakfast out of, aren't they? They're not going to be able to get their language right but we present it to our client and then we have to counter it back to our client, or, excuse me, the SRP on behalf of our client. Now, we, we could discuss and debate all afternoon. Are people actually after receiving this acknowledgement form gonna be brave enough to be self-represented? I don't know, we'll have to find out, won't we, right? But my brokerage policy is going to be do not interact with an SRP unless you come to me as broker of record and brief me on why they're making this decision. Okay. But this is the new reality that we've been handed by the government. The intention, think back to when we started this discussion. Why? Because the government said, there's too many consumers who don't understand the differences between being a customer and a client. And when I asked you guys, if you agreed, you said yes. So to make it crystal, to attempt to make it crystal clear that you're either represented or you're not, this is what we've been handed. This is not unique to Ontario. I've spent a lot of time speaking to our provincial counterparts who have self-representation and they're, they've been living this for a lot longer than us. Yeah, none of us like change, I know it. Like we don't, right? But, but we have to live up to the expectation that we've been handed. So I'm asked these questions as we wrap up self-represented discussion all the time. Can I show another brokerage's listing 
to an SRP. Good. Why? The number one. Somebody said number one. What do they mean by number one? They mean that, as a refresher for those of you who maybe came in late, your brokerage has to have a client. Another brokerage's seller is not your brokerage's client. So you guys get an A plus. Everybody got that one right. So we cannot show an SRP another brokerage's listing because of those golden nuggets that I shared with you. I see some of you sweating blood right now saying, well, there goes a lot of my buyer brokerage business, right? So if a buyer calls you on the phone about your brokerage's listing at 123 Main Street, Burlington, and the buyer says, oh, Ray, that's more money than my budget can afford, or that house isn't big enough, it doesn't have enough bedrooms, and you know on the same street in that same neighborhood, there's two other listings offered for sale by your competitor that would satisfy this buyer perhaps. Do you just hang up the phone at that point because you can't show another brokerage's listing to an SRP? And look, an initial buyer call, a, a cold buyer inquiry by email or phone or walk-in, is not a client, right? No, you're not a client until you've been made a client. So do we just now move forward and say, well, that's not my brokerage's listing, so I'm not showing it? I don't recommend, that's how we do it. My job here today, and that's why I call it, let's get real about Tressa. Let me share with you a lot of, a lot of what I've learned is misunderstood in our segment, in our industry. So, Let's say Sean, my friend Sean Morrison calls me as a buyer about my listing at 123 Main Street. And he says, Ray, it's not big enough. I need more bedrooms. And I know there's two houses in that same neighborhood listed by a competing brokerage that will satisfy Sean, hopefully. Here's how I suggest you guys embrace these cold inquiries moving forward so that you can, in fact, interact with these buyers and show them another brokerage's listing. Hey, Sean, would you be interested in me providing you information about other properties that are for sale in the same neighborhood that might be of interest to you? And what are you gonna say, Sean? Of course. Then I'm going to say to Sean, hey, Sean, would you like me to educate you about how the market is behaving in that neighborhood right now? That is, would you like me to provide you with sold data on homes that have sold in the neighborhood in the last three months? We all know buyers love sold data, don't they? So what are you going to say, Sean, when I offer you sold data? Yes, please. Then I'm going to say, Sean, when we find a home that you want to purchase, remember, in my example, pretend Sean's not a realtor. Sean, are you able to fill out the contracts on your own? And what's the average buyer going to say? No, right? Why did I have that conversation with Sean, the cold lead, who's not a client yet? I had that conversation. I asked him those three very simple questions because I just created implied agency. I got Sean's permission to offer him service. A lot of people say to me when I bring this up, you can't create a client relationship with a buyer, Ray, until they sign a BRA. That's not true. You can create agency. You can create a client by the things you say and the things you do. Who's with me on that? You can create agency by the things you say and the things you do. Now, I know it's best practice to get a BRA signed at the earliest practical opportunity. I know that's the guidance from the Real Estate Council of Ontario. But is that realistic? Is that how everybody does it? If you do a buyer consultation and you get a BRA signed before you let a buyer smell the leather in your car, you are doing a phenomenal 100% by the book job. But most realtors say to me, Ray, I like to go out and show a buyer a couple of homes 
to make them, make sure that they like me. I want to impress them with my knowledge. I want them to fall in love with me and my services before I throw a contract in their face. Who agrees with me that that is the practice more often than not, right? It is. What's the risk of not getting a BRA signed before you show a buyer properties? That they go and buy from somebody else and you don't get paid, right? That's the only risk. So don't lose sleep over a lot of your buyer brokerage business going by the wayside. Have conversations with your buyers. We're professionals. That's what we should be doing. Have conversations with your buyers. Can I make you aware of other properties? Would you like to receive that from me? Would you like me to educate you about market value? That is sold data. Are you capable of filling out contracts on your own? We just created implied agency. Then guys, I'm going to send Sean an email. My, my email to Sean is going to say, and there's, the, there's a key in here. Listen to this. Hey, Sean, as per your request, here's, Here's a summary of those properties currently available for sale that might be of interest to you. Next paragraph. Hey, Sean, as per your request, here's sold data from the last three months in the neighborhood you're looking in. Listen to this. This is a tease to more information later in today's presentation. Hey, Sean, here's a link to some information about real estate that we're going to discuss when we look at the first property together. Keep, hold that thought about here's a link to some information, okay? Now, let's summarize really quick. Moving forward, once trust is proclaimed, only self-represented party relationships or client relationships in real estate. When representing a client, you can interact with an SRP because that's a beneficial service to the brokerage client, but what can't you cause that SRP to rely upon? your skill, your knowledge, or your judgment. Self-represented party is not a sexy name change for customers. This is a very different meaning. This is not a name change. Okay? You guys now appreciate that being self-represented is very different than being a customer, right? And lastly, I know guys in all of my examples, I use the example of an SRP being a buyer. Buyers aren't the only ones that can be self-represented. What's an example of an unrepresented seller? A FISBO, right? So I don't wanna leave here today leading you to believe that only buyers are self-represented. Sellers can be unrepresented or self-represented if they're a FISBO, okay? So it goes both ways. Let's move on to the next topic of disclosures. So we all know that under REBA, there's lots of disclosures we have to make. And those disclosures remain the same in TRESA, right? And what are some common disclosures that we as realtors have to make? There's lots, but let's talk about the most frequent ones we encounter. Well, there's the disclosure of latent defects, right? There's the disclosure of material facts. There's the disclosure of the existence of an SPIS, right? The current code says if the seller fills out an SPIS, you have to make it available to the buyer. That's a disclosure. But a real common disclosure that we encounter as realtors is the disclosure of multiple representation, okay? We have to disclose to consumers that this transaction is a multiple rep, right? How do we do that today? Usually a confirmation of cooperation and representation, right? Moving forward, disclosures have to be made in the following way. I'm going to jump to this bullet point here. When we're making a disclosure, once TRESA is proclaimed, the document itself must prominently display the word disclosure. So if this is a disclosure document, where do we expect to see disclosure in a bigger font size than the rest of the document? Well, clearly at the top, the title of the document is going to be disclosure, right? So the documents moving forward must say disclosure when we're making a disclosure. The disclosure itself must be attention drawing and written in plain language that the lay person can understand. And isn't that fair? If we're a consumer and somebody's making a disclosure to us, we want to receive it in plain language so that we can understand it. And the regulations say that the disclosures must be presented in a way 
that brings the attention, that, that brings the user's attention to the information that's being disclosed, right? So that's simple, isn't it, guys? When we have to make disclosures, we use a disclosure document. ARIA is going to create the disclosure document for you. RAB doesn't have to create it. Your brokerages don't have to create it. ARIA standard forms are going to create this disclosure document for you. Okay. Um, if you use the seller property information statement today to disclose uh, a latent defect, can you do that moving forward? No. Why? Two reasons. One, seller property information statement doesn't have the title of disclosure at the top. And two, the reason that the government doesn't like the way we disclose latent defects if we use an SPIS, and I know in some areas of the province they're controversial and people hate them, but if you do in fact use them, burying a disclosure on a three or four page document is not attention drawing, is it? We'd all agree. So if you've got to disclose that the basement leaks every spring in a thaw, it's got to go on a disclosure document and you've got to say something like, in the spring every year, this basement leaks in a thaw. We can all understand that. Now, in a meeting I had with the regulator a couple of weeks ago, the registrar himself, he told me, and I'm going to share this with you guys, because it's very common for us, that the timing of disclosures is going to be a laser focus of the regulator with specific emphasis on the timing of the disclosure of multiple rep. So let me use this example. I have a property listed for sale in my brokerage. Anne works in the same brokerage with me. Anne represents a buyer on behalf of the brokerage. My, we work in the same brokerage, remember that. So if I've listed the property for the brokerage, Anne is working with the buyer for the brokerage. What do we have, guys? We have multiple rep, right? The regulator says, moving forward, the minute that Anne learns that multiple representation exists, we've got to advise the seller that multiple representation is going to occur in this transaction and get their consent to proceed. If, let's, let's, let me use a real life real estate example. How often in the past market, in the last market that we were in, did you see offers held until a future date and time? So imagine this example. I have a property listed for sale for the brokerage and works in the same brokerage with me. My seller signed a no conveyance that offers will not be looked at for five days. Anne shows the property today and gets an offer signed for a buyer today. We have multiple representation. Probably today, I present my seller client, the brokerage's seller client, with the confirmation of cooperation and representation that discloses multiple representation when? Five minutes before we review the agreement of purchase and sale. Is that not the practice today? The regulator is saying, guys, the minute that Ann got that offer signed, and knew that multiple representation in your brokerage was created, she needs to give me the disclosure document and I have to take it to the seller and say, seller, and from my brokerage works with me, we have multiple representation. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you remember when we talked about multiple representation when we listed the property for sale, don't you? Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, is it still okay with you that my brokerage proceeds in multiple rep? Yeah, that's fine. So the timing of the disclosure must be when you realize that it exists, okay? So let's hope none of us ever have a professional standards matter at the regulator. But if it happens and the regulator realizes that Anne didn't have that disclosure delivered to the seller until three minutes before the offer was presented, we have a discipline problem. So your takeaway from this is the regulator is laser focused on the timing of disclosures. When do realtors get BRA signed? In a lot of cases, five minutes before the offer is signed, right? If you have a professional standards case, I'm warning you that the regulator is gonna look at the BRA and say, Ray, why is the BRA signed 10 minutes before they signed the APS yet you, but you've been showing these people property for 30 days, right? So the timing of disclosures is critical. 
and the regulator is going to be laser focused on it. Let's talk about another common disclosure that the regulator is going to be focused on, material facts. First, I want to make sure you're clear on what a material fact is. A material fact is not a latent defect. A latent defect, as you guys know, is something that makes a, a home structurally unsound or unsafe that isn't readily visible to the naked eye, right? I like to call them latent defects because we find out about them later, right? A material, def a material fact, on the other hand, is something that matters to an individual, right? What matters to Carol Ann might not matter to me. So if I'm showing Carol Ann Holmes, she may say to me, Ray, I don't want to buy a house in which there was a death. That's a material fact to Ann. That's very different than a latent defect that makes a home structurally unsound or, or unsafe, right? So if you are working with a buyer in this example, you've got an obligation, the expectation under the code is that you have a conversation with your buyers and say, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, is there anything about a home that would deter you from purchasing it? Oh yeah, right. I would never buy a home in which there was a death. If I know that Carol Ann wants to look at three homes, I have an obligation to call the listing agent and ask if there was a, not, any kinds of deaths in that home. And if we find out there was, I have to put it on a disclosure document, take the disclosure document to Carol Ann and say, this home had a death in it. Do you still want to proceed? That's the expectation. We don't always find out about material facts by asking either, right? Like we should be to this day when we're meeting with consumers, asking them about material facts. Because how else are we gonna know they don't wanna buy a home in my example, in which there was a death. But sometimes you learn about a material fact by just conversation. As Nick said, I live in cottage country. 90% of my real estate practice is cottages. A lot of buyers, when I'm showing them cottages, say to me, you know, when we're not using this, we're going to Airbnb it. That statement is material to that buyer. It's material to that buyer that they can Airbnb that cottage, right? I just heard that. They didn't tell me that. I just heard that. My obligation then when I find out that they want to be able to Airbnb the cottage is to make inquiries of the municipality to find out if there's any Airbnb restrictions. Now where I come from, there's no Airbnb restrictions yet, but I know in other areas of the province, and the province is 444 municipalities, there's municipalities that have rules with regards to Airbnbs. So the regulator is gonna be focused on our inquiries to discover what's important to our clients. And then think back to the other slide. When you find out that that material fact exists, what do you got to do? Put it on the disclosure document. Now, next topic we're going to address is the information guide. The regulations, Tressor requires that anytime before you provide any services or any assistance to a consumer, you must present them with a copy of the information guide. Again, like the self-represented party acknowledgement form, the information guide is authored by RICO. Nobody else can author this thing. It's got to be, the only acceptable version is that which the regulator gives us. As chair of Tressa, I've had the privilege of seeing a draft copy of the information guide. The draft copy that I saw is 11 pages long. Everybody laughs when I say that. At ARIA, we are working very hard with the ministry to see this thing much smaller. We are of the opinion that consumers aren't gonna read an 11 page document, right? I like to call this thing the Apple terms of service for real estate. When I have to update my operating system, do you guys think I read all that stuff? No, what do I do? I scroll and I hit accept. That's what I'm afraid is going to happen because this information guide is just too long. And guess what guys? The 11 page draft that I saw is probably gonna get bigger because designated representation will be a reality most likely in the province of Ontario. So now the regulator has to incorporate a discussion of designated rep in the information guide. Whether we like the size of it or not, I've gone down a rabbit hole with that discussion. My focus should be 
You guys need to provide this information guide to every single consumer before you provide any services to them. And the expectation is that you review it with them. Okay. So remember that email I sent to Sean? Sean, here's, the, here's listings that might be of interest to you. Sean, here's some sold data. Sean, here's a link about real estate information. Guess what that link was? The information guide. See how I did that? The regulations say I must provide a copy to every consumer before providing any services. My email to Sean gave him the information guide. See how easily I gave him the information guide? And remember what I said in my email? I said, Sean, when we meet at the first property, I'm going to review this with you. Because the expectation in regulation is that you give it to them and you review it with them. My email to Sean did that. I've satisfied regulations with what I just did. The regulations are silent on how you deliver this beast, right? You can print out a hard copy if you want and hand it to every consumer. You can send an electronic link, right? I know that Rico is creating an interactive system where we as registrants can sign in and input the name and email address of our consumers and the RICO system will deliver the information guide on our behalf to the email address that we put in. And we as the registrant will receive a receipt by way of email that says, hey, Ray, the information guide that you asked to be sent to Sean Morrison was delivered. Okay, so RICO's creating that system for you. You don't have to use the RICO system. You want to send a link like I'm going to do? You can. You want to give a hard copy? You can. Okay. The only expectation is that you give it to them and you review it to them. More about the information guide later. You're probably saying, what the hell's in an 11 page guide so far? Let me tell you what the regulations say in here. First, and I think this is a good thing, the benefits of being a client of a registrant, right? Remember when we kicked this thing off, I said the government wants to make it crystal clear that here's all the benefits you get when you're a client Here's all the risks you assume when you're not a client. So in the information guide, before they receive any services from us, we're giving them this information guide that says, hey, Kathy, here's a list of all the benefits of being a client. Then it goes on to say to our consumer, hey, Kathy, here's, your duty, here's the duties and obligations that I owe you as a registrant, right? And turnabout is fair play. This document also says to the consumer, you have obligations to the realtor when you become a client, right? Like we know that when a buyer signs a BRA, they have to refer any inquiries about any property whatsoever to us. They're going to be reminded of that in the information guide before they receive any services from us. And again, here it is, just like that self-represented party acknowledgement form talks about risks, this document this 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 great big document is going to say here's all the risks of going it alone so so far those four bullet points say what here's all the advantages of being a client here's all the risks of not being a client again a very good thing that we work with fully informed consumers next you're not going to like this some of you may not like this this information guide according to regulations says to the regulator you've got to have a discussion in this information guide about the content of agreements with brokerages what are agreements with brokerages they're buyer representation agreements most commonly and listing agreements most commonly right so the information guide is going to say to real estate consumers if you're a buyer they're going to probably present you with a bra if you're a seller they're going to present you with a listing agreement here's the things you should be looking for in there with a specific emphasis on what? Remuneration, right? So what do you think this thing's gonna say? We all know that real estate commission, which is no longer called commission and trust, it's called remuneration. Real estate remuneration in the province of Ontario is not standard. It's an agreed upon amount between yourselves as the client and the listing brokerage. That's cool, right? We say that now. However, what's going to change? What new information is going to be provided to consumers is information regarding remuneration arrangements when circumstances change. So what in the world do I mean? This 
information guide, it's rightfully called an information guide because there's so much information in here, is going to say, hey consumer, if you list your home for sale with a real estate brokerage, you may wish to inquire about differing remuneration arrangements depending upon different circumstances. Let me use an example. I list a property for sale. I say to the seller, the seller and I agree to a remuneration of five apples, okay? We agree, total, total remuneration is five apples. We also have to say to that consumer, of those five apples, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, how many of them do you want to offer to a cooperating brokerage? It's not your decision, it's not my decision, how we break down that cooperating broker's commission. The government says, make sure that decision is, is, is the seller's decision. However, back to the discussion of differing circumstances causing differing remuneration. Again, in my example, I'm the listing broker. The seller may say to me after reading this guide, Ray, if your brokerage assists an SRP, we don't think you're entitled to any remuneration because you did nothing. Now, the regulations don't say you have to agree to that. The regulations say the information provided to consumers must have a discussion of differing remuneration arrangements. My brokerage policy will be, a, 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 a seller says to me, Ray, if you assist an SRP, we don't think you're entitled to the cooperating broker's commission. My response is, thank you very much for asking that question. The answer is no. I do not have to agree to it. Today, what's the difference? Today, you, you list a property for five, you, you say to a consumer, a prospective seller, yeah, our remuneration is five apples. How many consumers say, will you do it for less? A lot, right? And what do you say? You might agree, but you have every right to say no. So why am I hounding on this? I don't want to lead you to believe that you have to agree to different remuneration depending on different circumstances. Another discussion in this information guide may be, hey consumers, if the brokerage acts in a multiple representation transaction, you may wish to seek out a different remuneration other than those five apples. And if you ask me that in my brokerage, I'm gonna say no, the fee is the fee is the fee and it's always five apples, right? You don't have to agree. And lastly, this information guide says to the consumer, if you have a concern about a real estate transaction, your first approach should be to discuss it with the brokerage management, failing which you can seek out RICO. Initially, this, the regulation said, here's how to file a complaint with RICO. At ARIA, we said, come on, give the brokers of record the opportunity to address concerns. As a broker of record, I appreciate the opportunity to address the concern in-house versus the pomp and circumstances of a professional standards matter. Because if anybody's ever complained about a, a realtor in your brokerage, you know that it's a long process, right? And a lot of times, 90% of the times, if I have a concern in my brokerage, I resolve it by having a conversation with the consumer. We had a buyer walk into our brokerage, ticked that they lost out on a home. I said, brief me on what happened. He said, well, there was 12 offers on the property. We didn't even get a counter offer. That consumer thought they were entitled to a counter offer. We all know if there's 12 offers, you can't make 12 counter offers because guess what you did? You sold the house 12 times if everybody accepts the counter offer, right? We alleviated that concern. But your takeaway from the discussion of the information guide at a very high level is every consumer is to receive this information guide and the expectation is you review it with them, okay? RICO's Discipline Committee, here's a big one we fought for at ARIA. Currently under the current uh, legislation, if you are found negligent and you uh, are penalized by RICO's uh, Discipline Committee, any appeal, you're allowed to appeal, is heard by, guess who? The RICO Appeals Committee. We've advocated that any appeal should be heard by a quasi-judicial independent party and, and the government has agreed. So, so appeals moving forward once Tressa is proclaimed will be heard by an independent party. Isn't that fair, right? Like it should be heard by an independent. 
Okay. Now, um, brokers of record take note of bullet point number three. The regulator may reach out to you moving forward once trust is proclaimed and request transactional data from you. Hey, Ray, how many transactions did your brokerage participate in in the last six months? How many of those transactions were multiple rep? How many transactions involved in SRP? I now, because it's in the legislation, have to provide that information. My favorite is that RICO is now allowed to look into a registrant's conduct in the absence of a formal complaint. Remember in 2016, that CBC marketplace story where it showed six of our colleagues taking advantage of consumers. We were all, we were all very mad, right? At Aria, this happened when I was president, we went to the regulator and said, what are you doing about this? They said, nothing, there's no formal complaint. We were appalled. So that's why we said to the government, look, RICO's gotta be able to look into bad conduct, whether or not there's a formal complaint. That might be extreme, because there's not hidden cameras and we all don't make uh, national TV. But here's a real life example in my brokerage. One of the realtors in my brokerage listed a very high end property. And in the chattels included section of the MLS feature sheet, it said fridge, stove, washer, dryer, uh, bar stools, uh, pool table, all kinds of stuff. Like there was about 20 grand in, in chattels. We get an agreement of purchase and sale from a cooperating broker, chattels included section blank. What did the seller leave? What did the seller leave? Nothing. Nothing. The consumer, the buyer, files a complaint against the listing agent, my brokerage, saying the listing agent was false and misleading in their advertising because on the MLS feature sheet, it said chattels included bing, bang, boom. Well, the, the, the agreement of purchase and sale said chattels included blank. So of course they left nothing. We respond to the complaint. I took the time to respond on, the, on behalf of my registrant. And then I said to Rico, uh, the real issue here is the buyer's agent. The buyer's agent said in their complaint, my agent told me we didn't have to fill in the chattels included section because the MLS feature sheet said X, Y, Z. I said to Rico, that is wrong. I'm mad you wasted my time. I'm mad you put my realtor through this stress. You should be disciplining the buyer's agent for making crap up. We can't do that. There's been no complaint. Guess what? Moving forward, the buyer's agent's in hot water. Who likes that? I do, because I went through that hell. All right, guys. Here's a big one. What time do we have, Crystal? Okay, I'll move fast. We're almost done. Open offers. So we all know now that according to REBA, when there's multiple offers, what is our obligation? Our obligation is only to disclose the number of competing offers, right? Are you with me? Our obligation currently is only to disclose the number of competing offers. That rule, that obligation remains the same once TRESA is in effect. We still have the obligation to disclose the number of competing offers. That doesn't change. But what does change is that the seller's direction, the seller can say in a multiple offer process, I want you to tell all buyers the terms of this or these offers. So let's use an example. You've got a property listed for sale. There's 10 offers on the property. Your obligation is tell all 10 buyers they're competing with 10 offers, not nine offers and their own. And then your seller may say, when you list the property for sale, you know what, Ray, we're gonna conduct a blind bidding process. I know that Tressa allows me to disclose the terms of another buyer's offer, but that's not what we're gonna do. I believe the best way to get the most amount of money for my property is not to tell other buyers what somebody bid. I want people bidding blindly. And all of us during that pandemic buying uh, real estate market had situations where we had one offer, hundreds of thousands of dollars better than another, right? So I think a lot of sellers are going to say, nope, we're doing blind bidding because we believe that's gonna get us the best result. However, 
and then let me take it this far. I put on the MLS feature sheet in the offer instructions. Seller said, this is a blind bidding process. So I present all 10 offers. We do a blind bidding process. We've not told anybody anything. And then all of a sudden, once the offers are presented, the seller says, Ray, I want you to tell everybody the best offer on the table was $1.5 million. If you were a cooperating agent that brought an offer on one of my listings and in the offer remarks section, I said, this is a blind bidding process. Are you, do you think you might be upset that all of a sudden we changed the rules, right? Guess what guys, that's allowed. That's allowed. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here. I want you guys to be very careful when you're, I, I know Rab has a little bit of a different offer remarks field than where I come from Simcoe and district. But if you have an offer remarks section, do you guys have an offer remarks section, Crystal? Okay, so if you have a seller that says to you, we are going to conduct a blind bidding process. I'd think twice about saying that on an MLS feature sheet because when I was in a meeting with the RICO registrar, I said, Joe, would you, if a complaint was received that I put on an MLS feature sheet at the instructions of my seller that this was a blind bidding process and then in the heat of the moment, the seller changed their mind and, and, and it went open and then somebody complained saying Ray was false and misleading because he told us it was blind, but then he did open. What's the risk of me being accused and charged with false and misleading advertising? And while Joe didn't say yes, he didn't say no either. I think I, maybe I shouldn't have said anything, but I mean, it's gonna happen, isn't it, right? It's gonna happen. So my personal advice to you guys is be very, brokers of record and brokerage management in this room, you need to create policies from my point of view. But more importantly than that, when you're working with a buyer, you need to have an increased conversation with your buyers moving forward. Here's what I think you need to do. I think you need to say to your buyers moving forward, hey, Crystal, uh, how would you feel if in a multiple offer situation, the seller disclosed the terms of your offer to another buyer? Crystal might say, you know what? I just want to try to buy the damn house. And if that's what the seller is going to do, I just got to play by their rules. But do you guys believe that you might have other buyers that say, no way do I want the terms of my offer disclosed. No way do I want somebody to know my purchase price to be able to bid more than me. Do you think that would happen? Right? I do. So I think when you encounter a buyer who says, I don't want the terms of my offers disclosed, that buyer has three choices. One, they can walk away from the transaction and say, I'm not playing by these seller's rules. But is that, is that good for the buyer? No, they wanna buy the damn house, right? Another option would be, before you present any offer on behalf of your buyer client, ask them to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. And if they sign a non-disclosure agreement, I guess you can be assured that they're not gonna disclose the terms of your offer. Or, what I, my personal favorite, and we are working on this at ARIA, is a clause in the agreement of purchase and sale that says in the event that the seller discloses the terms of my offer, the offer becomes null and void, right? So your takeaway from this needs to be, you gotta have these conversations with your buyers moving forward because you don't want a buyer coming back saying, Ray, you told me that this was blind and then all of a sudden it went open. Cover your butts on this one. So let's summarize this. The obligation, to disclose the number of competing offers still exists. A seller can now execute an open offer strategy. There are no ground rules. The seller doesn't have to say at the time of listing, I'm going open or I'm going closed. They can tell you we're going closed, we're going blind, but they can change their mind in the heat of the moment. And there are no ground rules for sellers who change their minds. We all know that when a seller advances a delayed offer presentation. They tell us they're not gonna look at offers until Friday. Then in the heat of the moment, they say, ah, oh, we're gonna look on Wednesday. We've gotta follow a process, don't we? We've gotta let all parties who expressed interest in the property know that the offer presentation date has changed, right? We've gotta update the remarks on the MLS system. If a seller changes their mind with regards to an offer presentation strategy, there is zero rules. They can do it. So cover your butts, have these conversations with your, with your buyer clients. 
Couple more things on these regulations regarding the open offer process. If a seller chooses to disclose the term or terms of an offer or offers, every single buyer who submitted an offer must receive the same disclosure. Example, you got 10 offers. The seller says, Ray, only tell those five offers what the best price was because those other five I didn't like at all. No, you have to tell everybody. And lastly, before we move on, the, you are allowed to disclose anything at the seller's direction except information that is personal. What would be personal about a buyer? Well, their name and probably their home address, right? You can't say, hey, Sean, they have a house to sell at 123 Main Street. You can't, okay? So that's a summary of the open offer process, okay? Contents of written agreements moving forward must clearly comprehensively and prominently set out the following. In the case of a listing agreement, remuneration payable to any other brokerage. I know what you guys are saying. You're saying, you're thinking, look, we already do that. There's a blank for the total remuneration. Then there's a blank for the portion of that total remuneration that's offered to a cooperating broker. You're right. This is not the spirit of the new legislation. The spirit of the new legislation is that which I already said. The decision of the amount of the cooperating broker's commission is the sole decision of the seller. It's not yours. So if your practice today is our fee is five apples and we give two and a half of those apples to a cooperating broker and you didn't discuss this with a seller, you're in breach of TRESA. Number two, circumstances in which remuneration payable may change, right? So remember when we talked about in the information guide that some sellers may say, if you assist in SRP, I'm not gonna pay you the cooperating broker's commission. If you agree to that, and I wanna say again, you don't have to, but if you do, you've gotta put it in writing on the listing agreement, right? So that everybody knows what they agreed to. The services that the brokers will provide under the agreement, this is a big one, guys. Think of a listing agreement. If you say to a seller, I will post your listing on RABS MLS in 24 hours, I'll pay for professional photography, I'll pay for professional staging and I'll host an open house once a month until the property is sold. If that's your marketing strategy that you commit to with a seller, it's gotta be on the listing agreement moving forward. What does the current listing agreement say about our services when it comes to marketing? That the seller authorizes us to use our best efforts to market the property however we see fit during current market conditions that will change. So what do I anticipate ARIA will do? ARIA will create a schedule A to the listing agreement where you can say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, here's the services that I'm gonna provide you under this listing agreement. The terms related to the termination of any agreement. Now, again, I have to say, you don't have to agree to terminations. If you're listing a property for sale and the seller says, you know what, can I cancel my listing for any reason whatsoever just because I have a change of mind? You can say yes, but you can also say no, right? You don't have to agree to termination language if you're not comfortable with it, right? But if you do agree to termination clauses, it's got to be in the listing agreement. No more verbal, no more text, no more email. It's got to be in the written listing agreement. And guys, how many, the current expiry dates on our written agreements with our clients have to be initialed if they're six months or greater, right? Moving forward, those expiry dates have to be initialed no matter what. One day, one week, one month, six months, one year, every expiry date has to be initialed. But I'm going fast because I wanna get this all in. We've talked about multiple rep already, so I'm gonna close with this discussion of designated representation. So, you guys all know that Tressa was supposed to come into effect on April 1. We know that in late March, the government slammed on the brakes. The government didn't slam on the brakes because RICO wasn't ready. They didn't slam on the brakes because ARIA wasn't ready. They slammed on the brakes because RICO and ARIA said to the government, while we've got this legislation wide open, why are we not having a discussion about designated representation? Designated representation is something that ARIA has been asking for since 2017. Designated representation will not be unique to Ontario. It's already practiced in Ontario, New Brunswick and British Columbia. So what is designated representation? Sean and I work in the same real estate brokerage. I have a property listed for sale for the brokerage. Sean secures an APS from a buyer. What do we have? We have multiple representation. We know that when multiple representation exists, that the services that we can provide to our brokerage's clients are reduced, right? 
We cannot have conversations with our brokerages clients in multiple rep about anything related to money or motivation. If the buyer says to Sean, when they're buying the brokerage listing, Sean, what should I offer? Sean cannot answer that. If the buyer says to Sean, Sean, why are these sellers selling? And Sean knows they've already bought another house firm. And this is a multiple rep transaction. Sean cannot answer that question because it's multiple rep. We can't talk about money or motivation in multiple rep, right? You guys know this stuff. Designated representation will change that. Designated representation would allow the brokerage to appoint an agent in the brokerage to solely advocate for and represent the seller. And it would allow the brokerage to appoint another agent to fully advocate for and represent the buyer. So if designated representation becomes a reality in the province of Ontario, I can advocate in my example for the seller. I can answer the seller's question about money or motivation when Sean, my colleague in the same brokerage, secures an offer from a buyer. If I'm dumb enough as the listing agent when Sean says to me, Ray, why are they selling? And I say, they've already bought another house firm and it's closing in 30 days. Sean can then tell the buyer that in designated representation. And is this not what our consumers want? Is it not, right? Kathy's clapping and I wish you all were because designated representation is what consumers expect from us. When a consumer hires Sean Morrison to help them buy a property, no matter which listing they're buying, they want Sean's advice, guidance, and counsel. They want Sean to say, Sean, what should I offer? Sean, should I accept this counter offer? They don't want to hear, oh, I'm sorry, this is a multiple representation transaction and I can't talk about anything related to money or motivation. This will give consumers exactly what I think they want and that they think exists already today. Consumers work with us as individual realtors because they know, like, and trust us. They don't get this bit where the brokerage is actually the representative and the agents are, are, are just independent contractors, right? They don't get it and they don't care about it. Now, if you're a sole proprietor and you're saying, I don't have a designated agent in my office, or if you are worried about double-ended transactions, like I'm from small town, rural Ontario, there's lots of times I know the seller and I know the buyer who's, who, who are putting a transaction together. The seller wants to work with me because they've known me my whole life. The buyer wants to work with me because they've known me my whole life. They don't want me to say, I can't talk to you about money or motivation, but if they like me enough, they may say, you know what, Ray, we're still cool with the traditional model of multiple reps. So what I mean by that is designated representation in Ontario under a RIA's proposed model, which I'm hopeful we will achieve and I'm confident we will achieve because of our advocacy efforts, is that designated representation is an additional positive option. Your brokerage doesn't have to opt into being designated rep or multiple rep. It's a transaction by transaction basis. In other provinces, brokerages have to opt in to be a designated representation brokerage or a traditional brokerage. In Ontario, we've said, look, let the consumers decide depending upon the circumstances. Don't tie the consumer's hands. Let's give the consumers what they want. Stay tuned for an announcement from the ministry, which Aria will communicate to you. Uh, I know I, I have the inside scoop on this, but I'm bound by a confidentiality agreement with the government not to disclose it. But what I will say is be ready for Tressa to come into effect and be ready for designated rep. Okay. And you know what, I'm not going to review with you guys because I know we're up against the clock. Uh, those things that we're going to be advocating for in our phase three consultation, I will just simply say, watch for emails from Aria because every single one of you as an individual realtor, your real estate association, Rab, our stakeholders, you have input into the phase three consultation where we're gonna talk to the government about continuing education. We're gonna talk to them about cooling off periods. We're gonna talk to them about the auctioneer exem exemption. Okay, so stay tuned. I'm not going to review them in detail with you because I know I talked too much. And on that note, I don't know, Chris, if we've got time for Q&A, do we? So I'll take any questions. Go ahead, Kathy.
Ac yep, excellent question. I brought that exact question to Joe Richet. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my bad. So Kathy asked, if a seller, if a prospective seller is interviewing three different brokerages, three different agents, what information can you give to that prospective seller? Because they're not your client yet, are they? So what is the expectation of a seller during a, during a listing interview? They want you to tell them what they should list their house for, don't they? They want you to talk to them about what they need to do to get their house ready for sale. And Kathy is recognized that that information requires her skill, her knowledge, and her judgment. So her question is brilliant. Can I, in a listing interview, give this information? The registrar said to me in my last meeting with him last week, yes, because that is, is general real estate information, and he, he called it marketing. So it's on the record from the registrar that we can continue to do business as usual when it comes to listing interviews with different realtors. Great question, Kathy. Anybody else? Yes. The, yep, good question. Yeah, so, okay, good. I'm gonna, that's a two part question. The question was, we're hosting an open house, a buyer walks in, what can we do? So, it's a service to the brokerage client to host an open house. So, that buyer that walks in is a cold lead, therefore they're not a client. The question was, they ask us for comparables. So the buyer who's a cold lead, who walks into your open house, who asks you for comparables, can you give them comparables? Somebody yell something out. The answer is no, because selecting comparables requires your skill, knowledge, and judgment. Anytime you guys have to select solds from a database, you are using your skill, your knowledge, and judgment to pick the comparable ones that are right. So yes, you can host an open house, but you've got to be very careful what you can say to the consumer who walks in your open house. Yes, sir. You can answer those because that's general. What are the taxes? That's general information. Is there, a, is there a parking spot included? Yeah, there is. That's general information. Well, how much did the last parking spot sell for? You can't answer that though, because that requires your skill, your knowledge and judgment. Yes, ma'am. Yep. I get it entirely that the expectation under the new legislation is you can't interact with an SRP if it requires your skill, your knowledge and judgment. Now, I, I hate to go down this road, but in the interest of being fair and sharing with you. So the regulator said to me, if a seller says to you, Ray, if an SRP asks for a CMA, you can do that with the permission of your seller, but the regulator said you better be giving them true comparables. We all know, we all know that I can find, listen up guys, we all know that any one of us could find an anomaly, right? We can find an anomaly sale, right? We can find that one sale that doesn't make sense, right? We can find that one sale that sold on a street where every house sold for 2 million, but this one sold for 2.5. The regulator said you better be selecting true comparables. So the regulator's advice was you can put a cover sheet on that CMA with your seller's permission that says something like, this is the CMA that I shared with my seller when we establish their asking price. Okay. Part two of her question. Yeah. 
they're not your client yet, but you said you were so smart and you have to do that they know who they like and who they trust you at the open house, they then want to work with you. They're they're not saying they're self-represented. I, I understand there's some issue in there where I am self-represented, I never want to work with a realtor. But how how do you get them to you can have a meaningful conversation. Sean, would you like to receive information about other properties currently available for sale? Sean, would you like to receive information about what other homes have sold for in this neighborhood? That's a meaning, there is no gray area. Look, I, whether you guys like it or not, there's no gray. In Tressa, you're self-represented or you're a client. Look. I don't know who's ever going to want to be self-represented when they get the information guide and they get that self-represented party acknowledgement form. To the, Rico has said to me numerous times, the only person that should ever be self-represented is somebody who is incredibly sophisticated, maybe a lawyer, maybe a realtor. Look, I bought a property somewhere in Ontario that wasn't in my trading area. Guess what I did, guys? I hired a realtor to represent me because I didn't know what I was doing in that area right? So whether we like it or not, this is what you need to walk away from. Customer created a lot of gray. When I asked you guys, is there a lot of gray area with customer? The overwhelming majority of you said yes. And even those of you who say no, I, I, I suspect I could trip you up on that and ask you questions and you all of a sudden you answer to create a client relationship. The, the reason for these changes is because consumers reported to the government that they didn't understand. The intention of the government, I think we should support, it's to create black and white. When you receive the information guide, when you receive the self-represented party acknowledgement form, you, you, you will, people say to me, oh, the consumers are gonna say they didn't know what they were signing. So I said to Joe, the registrar, I said, Joe, what do you, it, we're the author of the document. If people sign that document with all these risks, guys, there's going to be a lot of risks. The regulator's going to say, I'm sorry, Ray, you signed that document that you read it and we put a laundry list of those risks on there. You decided to proceed knowing those risks for whatever reason, suck it up. Yes, sir. So what do we have to do to comply with the minimum? Because I think there's a lot of policy concerns that have to look at. Some of this stuff is good stuff. Some of this is all very good. This is taking the uh, amplification of the Some of it is good stuff. It's not new owners. Look, I in 2002, the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act was signed into law. Four years later, it was proclaimed in 2006. I, I was a realtor in those days, but I always, like I, I became a realtor in 1999. The other instructors who, who facilitate this for ARIA actually were instructors when Reba was passed into law and then proclaimed. What you just said is the exact same thing those instructors said about Reba. Look, I acknowledge, is this perfect? No. Is it a learning curve? Yes. But I do think the initiative of the government to make consumers aware, like if you guys read, I read two hours worth of professional standards cases every day because I do a lot of professional development uh, stuff. 
our members are screwing customer up all the time. So is it difficult for us right now? And it's easy for me to say this is a good thing because I've been doing this for three years. I mean, I was the chair of this from day one. It's easy for me to understand. And that's why Aria has been out here for the last six to 12 months saying, guys, here's the expectation in Tressa. And you guys heard me say it five times today. Whether you like it or not, this is the expectation, right? No. Yep. No, it, we acknowledge that. You know why I'm going to disagree with you there? Because you, you are, then you aren't treating buyers. Buyers today have to decide whether they're a customer or a client. If they choose to be self-represented, that's entirely right. You can't give them that information. I Look, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you're either represented or you're not. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you want to go it alone. Here's the risks you assume. I think that's more crystal. And then I'm going to move to somebody else. And I'm, you know, I, I'm happy to have this debate with you. But I'm telling you right now... <coughs> Realtors are screwing up the customer conversations all the time. And I do think once you wrap your heads around it, you will get that clarity. I'm at an advantage because I've been doing this for three years. You know, we received the regulations from the government. We said, this will work, this won't. Is everything in here we agree with? No. My job today is to say, guys, this is what the expectation is and be ready for it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Happens. This kind of self representation, you get that option. 100% equals your pattern. Okay. The, part, the question is what kind of conversation you can have when you're being interviewed as a potential buyer that it's problematic. I get it. It's going to be more difficult. And to this lady's question here, I get your point of view. I'm a realist. I'm a realtor. I've been doing this for 27 years. I know we're always being interviewed. I get it, and I acknowledge that it may turn somebody off when I say, you know what, I'm sorry, sir, I can't answer that question because at this point, you're not applying. Some people will assume that that's a pushy sales tactic. I get it. You know, we've got to work on the language. I've taken, I've, I've, I've suggested some language for you guys with the open offer process to avoid you getting into hot water, and we may have to fine tune our conversations when we introduce this topic of self representation. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the green shirt. I am curious to know the people that work on this situation have any idea, any knowledge of our business. <laughs> he wanted to know if any of the people that worked on this file, and I will say, sir, you as an individual member received communication from RAP, you received information from RICO, you received information from Aria to engage in this process. I don't think you answered my question. My question is... Yes, you know, the answer to this question is yes. Your board, of, your board of directors at RAP, I'm confident, engaged in this process. The members of Aria board of directors engaged in this process. So, I mean, whether you like the outcome or not, yes. You would... How would you feel about a ban on multiple reps altogether? That was in the initial regulations. So while you might not like some of this stuff, to answer your question, the only person you can blame for not engaging when you were asked to do so by RAB, by RICO, by ARIA, is those people who didn't engage. And in the interest of time, I got to move on right there. Look, that's, that, that's I am not a, fair. I am you asked me if people were involved, which stakeholders were involved, and the answer is yes. 
I have a receipt, I have a receipt now. On the government from side. From the SRP, which is nearly yes. to, yep. to my obligation to the seller. How much yes. changes I can make to that? As so many as you want. Her question was, an SRP writes their own offer. It's garbage. It's not done well. How many changes can the seller make to the buyer's offer? As many as the seller wants because it's a counter offer. They told me you can just give me the hook when I have to, Crystal. So. Maybe one more question. Okay, one more question. I'm going to take the gentleman right here. I'm just wondering if I have a sample that you gave that I thought was actually interesting, but he's a big question for me. When you were giving the example with uh, Sean, and you were saying, well, what I would do, and this is now a call that comes in, so you're starting off the set of fresh. And you're saying, that, and they start asking you questions. And you're saying, would you like, what would you like, would you like? And the guy says, well, right, sure. So now we got this implied relationship. Yeah. Then you turn around and you say, so then what I would do is I would send it to and I would give you the examples, I would give them this, and then I would give him that link. Yeah. And when he reads the link, if he so chooses for some stupid reason, that he doesn't want to work with you, you give him the information which you're saying we're not allowed to have. You have failed to recognize that the conversation that I had where Sean bought in my example created an implied agency, and that's permitted. Whether you like to do it that way or not is your decision, right? You don't have to do it that way. If you can do it a better way, a way that's more comfortable with you, you're entitled to do so. And I can't take any more questions. Crystal's already mad that I went over time, but I will say guys, Rico is on this. Stay tuned for an email very shortly from Aria. In addition to letting you know when the proclamation date is, when you have to comply, you will receive information about whether or not designated representation is a reality. And remember that, guys, listen, this is critical. Guys, remember that COVID website that Aria created under Sean's leadership? for guidance, how we as realtors were able to continue to practice real estate as an essential service. Aria has ready to be released a brand new website strictly for Tressa, full of FAQs. We take your questions that you asked today, no matter how difficult or tough they were, we are responding to each and every one of them for you guys in one central location. One hour, whatever time we had together here today clearly isn't enough to embrace this but Aria truly has your back on this. Look for that website and send your questions. If you have further questions today to governmentrelations at aria.com, send it to your RAB leadership. They'll funnel it back to Aria. This isn't over. You've got, you guys have an avenue with your provincial association to get your questions answered and that's it. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the presentation and all the information you provided us here with regards to the legislation. So, there's a lot of information that a lot of information we learned here today that will impact our real estate sector. And so, I just want to thank Maria for keeping us up to date and providing us resources such as yourself and for keeping. And having the, the message as a realtor to realtor, someone like Ray, who is a realtor himself and is involved, it's great to hear those messages from him. Thank you so much. And now for uh, some quick wrap updates and announcements. After our professional development summer break, we'll be kicking things off in September again with some great learning opportunities. September 7th, we have a course on best legal practices when dealing with residential tenancies um, in Ontario, followed by a course on understanding principal residence versus capital gains versus income for real estate transactions. And that's gonna be taking place on September 19th. So September 7th, tenancy, September 19th, uh, principal residence, capital gains and income. And then Matrix Mondays will also return at the end of September on September 25th, with a course on customizing your hot sheets and market watch widgets to maximize your results for your clients and to save you time. So registrations for those courses are open on the member portal. So professional development is starting back up after our summer break, September 7th, 19th, and 25th. 
Then some upcoming events. We have our annual walkathon. It's our third annual walkathon starting in September for support for the support of Habitat for Humanity here in Hamilton. So grab your team of four or a pair, and I'm sorry, grab your team of four and a pair of running shoes. And as registration opens up soon, check out the newsreel. They'll be coming out after our Civic Long Weekend with further details. And the Tiger Cats draw for everyone that was here today. It's the Tiger Cats game for Thursday, August 17th against the Edmonton Elks. And who's drawing it? Someone from staff? Claire Thomas. Claire Thomas? So Claire Thomas won the Tiger Cat tickets. Is she virtual or is she virtual? She's virtual. So congratulations, Claire. So a member of our team will follow up with you, Claire, after the event today. So um, before we close out today's event, just want to remind everyone that we'll be sending out a short survey via email to everyone, just to collect some of um, some feedback on your experience with today's <coughs> event. So we really appreciate your time to fill out that quick survey. And also a link to today's recording of this event will be available on Newsreel tomorrow for um, any other members. So if you're talking to any other members or colleagues that weren't able to be here today, please pass that information on to them. So again, thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Ray, thank you for taking the time to come out for a presentation. Everyone have a great day and enjoy the rest of the summer. We'll see you